Uh, hello and welcome to uh, our Innovate session uh, talking about becoming an effective storyteller with data visualization. And it's been presented by uh, myself, Steve Wright, and Gordon Ken Muir from uh, Baxter Credit Union. And uh, just before we get going here, we just want to go through a, a quick housekeeping slide. Uh, again, welcome to the uh, Innovate event. And just to let you know that all of the recording session, all of the conference sessions are being recorded and they'll be av available and uh, be released after the event as well. And we also have a live presenter interaction available at the end of each session. Uh, so uh, please stick around for that where you can um, talk with and, it, and interact with the presenters on each of their sessions, sort of a 30 minute Q&A in the lounges uh, area of the uh, event platform. And also, again, throughout the day, we'll have our sort of our live, our live open floor session uh, hosted by the Cyrus and support and other uh, team members within the Cyrus and family that can be there to answer any questions you have. Um, it's a place where you can drop in throughout the day uh, to ask any questions on on sessions uh, that are coming up or that you've missed or any other general questions that you have for the Cyrus and team. So again, welcome to Innovate. Uh, it's glad to have you here. Introduction on my side, I'm Steve Wright. I'm the uh, Global Support Manager for Cyberson, and uh, my responsibility is to look after all things support across our three major geographic regions, Asia Pacific, APAC, uh, North America, um, US uh, Americas region, and also our EMEA, which is our Europe, Middle East and Africa regions. And um, along with me is uh, Gordon Kenya. So I'll let Gordon talk to Hi, you. folks. Uh, yeah, my name is Gordon Kemmuir. I work for Baxter Credit Union, or BCU, as you may, you may hear it's called. Uh, I've been in the service desk industry for uh, way too long, more than 25 years now. Um, I actually lead a team for BCU of level one, two, and three support engineers. Um, I'm an ITIL certified expert. I've uh, been studying that for the last several years. Uh, and so my, my experience comes from a range across the portfolio and across the life cycle of uh, ITIL service management. That's great. And it, I'm excited to have Gordon, uh, uh, Gordon and I co-present because it just makes it a lot, a lot friendly. You'll be joining us on a conversation that we're having just around this, uh, around this topic. And we're both service desk managers um, in, our, in our own rights. And we look at similar data um, because of our organizations, but often we look at things in, in different ways. Um, Gordon's reports are, are very different. His reporting line is different to my reporting line, for example. And um, you'll kind of pick up some of that in terms of how we look at data and how we discuss the, the journey that we take to get from, you know, from data to knowledge. Yeah, and certainly my, my data, um, Steve, as you know, is very internally focused, right? So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a, an internal serving organization. I don't have uh, external customers as such in, in the same way that you do and so right. a lot of my data um, and my visualizations my stories are very much um, designed to to satisfy an internal IT leadership audience versus an external customer facing audience which I know is certainly a big uh, a big part of your life yes yeah and uh, yeah a, a lot of my my uh, my service desk environment covers a lot of customers so there's elements in terms of how we work that uh, that have to be sensitive to external facing data. So, and the other thing is that, um, obviously this, this event is called Innovate 2021, and uh, we wanted to sort of ask that question, how can we apply innovation to our data visualization journey? And I guess we should really start by understanding what is innovation? You know, why do we innovate as an organization, as a team, and what is innovation? And uh, for me, I've got a couple of key points here in terms of why we innovate. And uh, feel free to jump in there, Gordon, as well. Uh, one is to embrace change. I think innovation by its nature is is something new. So we have to yeah. be in a place where we need to embrace the change, right? Yeah, and certainly, you know, Steve, it, it, and I'm sure many of us here can, can uh sympathize with this right the only constant in our world is change right yes. and, and if we're if we if we don't embrace the change if we don't innovate to meet the change then um you know one of my favorite phrases is get on board or get run over right <laughs> if you if you don't get on board with the change then it that's going to run you over and so you yes. have to 
you have to innovate to meet the the changing needs of the business and the changing needs of your customers and the tools and and everything else that's changing the world around you yeah 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 and and you know face the fear and do it anyway <laughs> Uh, also, innovation creates new opportunities. Um, again, by its nature, yeah, there are there are new things to be to 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 have out there, and closely aligned with that is cultivating new growth and learning. And um, we hope that some of the things that we talk about today is going to sort of um, spark some sort of innovation uh, thoughts within your within your scope of of work, whether it's um, bringing out a new uh, a new data point and a new knowledge area. Um, these are things that we want to be able to cultivate. You know, new new growth and learning. I think people, my team, thrives on having things that are new and and that they can grow into. Yeah, and certainly we hope that some of the some of the tools and and sample charts and and stories that we tell you here today. Um, you know, we hope it, we hope it takes you away and back to your back to your workspace, and you're thinking, how can, how can I do something like that? How can I start that journey, um, and, and perhaps answer the questions that my leadership team's asking me or my clients are asking me a little better, a little yeah. easier. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And then the last point on this one that it's fun. I mean, it it really is. It really is fun. Anyone that knows me knows knows that I I like to laugh a lot. I like to grin a lot. Um, uh, I've got a saying that if it's not fun, it's not going to get done. You know, um, it doesn't always have to be enjoyable. You know, work is work, and sometimes you just got to you got to buckle down and grind it out. But essentially, you want to find the fun in what you're doing. You want to find the fun in the opportunities and the growth and the learning. For sure, yeah, and and like you said, if it's not fun, it's not done, right? So yeah. you, you got to find that opportunity. You got to find that that little spark that's that's going to keep you coming back for more. Yeah, absolutely. So then, what is innovation? Uh, sort of the dictionary definition says it's to do something in a new way, um, or to introduce something as or as if it was new. And um, you know, it's it's always useful to have the definition in the back of our minds in terms of what we're doing with innovation. It's a phrase that's often used and sort of used and abused in some ways because it's just a thing that if it's not what if it's not the old way, it must be innovative. And that's not always, you know, sometimes not the old way is not necessarily a new way. Indeed. <laughs> that makes sense. No, that totally makes sense. sense. Totally makes sense. <laughs> And then um, we wanted to kind of look at sort of, sort of types of innovation and there's lots of reading out there and uh, I came across some um, some interesting research just looking at sort of types of innovation along the along two axes. We're looking at technology and market um, and I think that's kind of relevant for where we are in our space and um, you know technology is along the bottom there with market along the, along the side and if you have innovation that sits in in terms of being in the space of existing technology and an existing market, uh, it's usually called incremental innovation. Um, it kind of feels the most comfortable. You know, it's the place that you know. You know your technology is existing. You know your marketplace. You know, it's it's a known quantity. So innovation in that space is it tends to be incremental. Not a bad thing. Just a definition. But not quite so exciting. Uh, not quite so exciting. That's true. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't kind of smack of the newness of innovation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's not. You know, you're not maybe getting some of that learning. You're not getting some of that um, fun, right? If if it's yes. a incremental innovation is necessary, right? And as yes. you as you think about, and some of the slides we'll show you later talk about kind of a, a cyclical approach to improvement and innovation and certainly incremental innovation is necessary um, mm. but it's not as much fun as is is getting into something completely new yes yeah yeah and and also as you say that the thing is you need to almost start from incremental innovation to get Absolutely. your chops ready for what's coming down the pike so if you move from you know that incremental innovation into uh, extending technology into new technology with an existing market, it opens you up. It opens up, it opens you up for disruptive innovation, and um, that tends to be kind of one of the most common terms. You know, you see something new in a space that you've known, and you think, "Oh, wow, this is a game changer." Um, yeah, and one of the things I, I, I like to, especially as folks are, are watching this this here. Um, 
disruptive doesn't have to mean like Bitcoin was disruptive to the financial world, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that was clearly very disruptive, right? And, and, and cyber currencies have become yeah. huge in our in our world, in our in our daily lives. Um, disruptive for some folks here might be as simple as using some of the tools that, that we talk about here towards the end of the presentation that perhaps they've never used, right? So right. in coming away from a simple, um, you know, a simple table or, or a simple Excel document to, to using Power BI or Power Query or some of the yeah. other tools we're going to talk about, that could be pretty disruptive for, for some yeah. folks here who are fairly early in their journey of thinking about data visualization. Yeah, absolutely. And then we can also move on the other side of this axis where we, we use existing technology in a new market. Um, oops, and then that example is is architectural innovation. And I, I don't, I there's not as many, there's not as many um, sort of examples maybe in that space, but I know I can I can think of things that we've built within the known area of existing technology and existing markets, and we've thought that that could apply to a new marketplace. It's actually a nice way to innovate because you know you it's you're learning about the market rather than learning about the technology. Um, so depending on your industry, you know, architectural innovation may be something that is a is a, a key point of growth uh, for you. Absolutely. And, yeah, and then we have the the sort of the the new the new on both sides. We've got new technology and new market, and that tends to be a radical innovation. Um, you know, radical meaning that the, we've actually changed the, the the base on which we innovate. We're not nothing's new nothing's based on the existing we're looking at new technology new markets and uh it's a uh, radical i mean it's definitely a, it, it could be a total game changer um and whether you get to it from either of the disruptive or architectural innovation routes to get to radical or you go straight from existing to brand spanking new um those are kind of the the dimensions if you like of innovation that we wanted to kind of cover yeah, I'm not sure many of us would recommend, uh, Stephen, over you. I don't think I'd want to go from incremental straight to radical. That's a, that's a pretty aggressive journey. Um, uh, yes. Hopefully, hopefully you go via one of the yellow boxes, not straight from blue to blue. That, that, yeah. that, that seems yeah. a little much to bite off in your first go around. Yes, yeah, hence hence the name radical, I think. <laughs> so, um, but it's interesting, to, again, to show the dimensions of innovation. And, and sometimes it's needed. Right. I mean, sometimes yes. depending on the situation you find yourself in, you may have no choice, right? You may mm -hmm. have to go find a new solution to meet a new marketplace demand. Yes. Yeah. Um, but but it's not the typical journey, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's the uh, that's the innovation uh, sort of backdrop there. Um, our challenge, our collective challenge, Gordon and is is really getting data to knowledge, and. Um, this phrase, uh, we're drowning in data yet starved of knowledge, is actually a paraphrase from a book written by John Nesbitt in 1982, I think it was, Megatrends. And it's amazing that, you know, the book that's over 40 or 40 years old um, still has that point, which is as relevant today as it was back then. Yeah, in a lot of ways, nothing's changed. <laughs> more things change the more they stay the same right you, yeah it, it, yeah it, no matter how how strong your data is or or how knowledgeable you think you are you might get a new manager a new client a new challenge that requires you to rethink your entire strategy from the right. ground up rethink your data points and, and and reformulate all of your your visualizations yeah yeah and and it's and it's that that myth of more data gives me more knowledge which is a dangerous thing i mean I guess back when this book was written, uh, there was not there was not such thing as a petabyte, for example. Let alone, you know, um, the amount of data, the amount of data points we have now. Um, so we're still drowning um, and uh, and needing to see knowledge out of it. And the question is, like, you know, what should we report on? And uh, you know, we we get that we get that we ask. I mean, I ask myself that question even before the business asks me the question. You know, but um, it's a question of what do we want to get from the data? And then what are people really asking us to report on? Which is another interesting point there. Um, I'm sure you got some stories there, Gordon. <laughs> yeah, this one this one's really important because, um, you know, I've been with BCU for five years mm -hmm. and when it, within my interview almost, but within my, certainly with my, my very first, you know, couple of days at the organization, um, 
my my boss's boss was asking me for all kinds of reports right hey you're the new guy help me understand you know why we should why we should why we hired you and, and what you what the story wow. you're trying to tell us the service desk is and stuff yeah. and i'm like oh, hang on a minute i haven't even seen the data yet never mind anything else <laughs> but but trying to understand as quickly as possible what the requirements were right mm -hmm. it's very very important as much as you can and you're always going to get that that you know what is what is a equal right or what is b telling us right yes but as much as you can before you jump into the report itself try and tease out as you know those requirements try and understand the story that they are asking you to tell yeah. rather than assuming that you know the story right. they're asking you to tell because yeah. even if you told that story in a previous organization or to a previous manager, this manager is almost certainly going to have a different spin on it or this yeah. client's going to have a different spin on it. And so making sure you understand what they're really asking is is going to save you a lot of pain in the long term. Yeah, yeah. And and, and it, it's an, it's, it really is an example of there's no there's no silly question. You know, uh, sometimes people want to go down the assumption, the assumptive route because they don't want to appear stupid or just ignorant sometimes you really want to get down to the basics of what what are you really being asked to report on um, and at this point here understanding implication versus influence and sounds kind of wordy but in, in a sense sometimes when someone asks for a report they're implying that the data is going to give them something that the data may not and you know, we have that side of the argument that says I want X because I think this data point is going to give me it. But until you actually go into the data and reveal, you know, look at the data sets that you need to um, expose and, and give some context to the data and go through those exercises, you want to get an influence from the data. You can't put data, you can't put an, you can't put an idea onto data. You've got to get, you know, you've got to pull what data, the data is telling you from it. So that's the influence part of it. Um, and that's that's all that's often a it's it's a it's a ding dong seesaw battle. It's there's never one place you're going to land on and it's always going to be that. Um, and that's really important. The other point is that information should you know, the information that you gather, it should determine actions or behaviors. Um, uh, it's no there's no value. There's no value in spending lots of cycles to present data as information only for it not to lead to some action or behavior um, right and and that's key steve to what we talked yeah. about earlier right about knowing those requirements is, is what is that what is that person trying to prove seek for you know um possibly put in a budget for a change mm -hmm. right what what are they what is the outcome that they're looking for because if you can't provide the data or the information to support either the assumption they're making the change they're trying to fund or or the trend they're trying to see, um, mm -hmm. then they're never going to look at that report ever again, right? Yeah. So so the understanding that requirement and being able to meet it, um, or being able to not meet it and understanding why, yeah. and then changing the changing the journey. And we'll talk a little bit about later about changing the journey in the data, but mm -hmm. understanding if if the, you can't answer their question, um, knowing why you can and and what you're going to do to get there in, yeah. in some some time frame. Yeah. And then the other point is that data has content and context. We'll see this as we build out as we build out the journey. But data has context and content, but in the end, it's just data. And um, I've I, I actually since building this this presentation up, I've used that term. It's just data to uh, a, you know a few stakeholders in the in the business just to take the take the emotion or sort of the sometimes you've got a backdrop between if you're reporting bad news for example or you're reporting a, a radical change in in a metric it's just data let's let's look at it in its in its disparate um sort of um non-emotional sense if you like um let's look at where the numbers are coming from whether our data sets are correct you know um what it's what the numbers are pointing towards how is it showing up a, a number that's high or low may not show up in our business you know ever if at all or you know over time so you really have to make sure that there's a there's an understanding that it's just data yeah yeah and then we get the hey could you um i think we've all had those kind of requests either verbally or 
through a through a chat or an email request. You know, um, I, and I'm sure everyone on the call can sort of uh, um, put their own spin on this list. You know, we got. I'll go through them all. Show me a health report. Get me a dashboard that tells me how we're doing. Uh, uptime, downtime. You know, what kind of ROI we could generate? I mean, such a loaded question. <laughs> Um, well, what our backlog is again, uh, you know, if there's no specificity is key, you know, just sometimes these questions just come out at us from left field. So yeah, what's and, getting worked on? And, and you know, if I take some of this, I mean, some of them are pretty complex, like show me a health report or get me a dashboard that shows how we're doing, right? That the mm-hmm. number of questions that you could ask to try and clarify those requirements could could take days. Yeah. Um, but even something that that you know looks as simple as can you tell me where uptime downtime is? Well, do you want uptime downtime including um, maintenance windows? Do you want it including plan yeah. change? Do you want it um, only during the, the hours that that service is due to serve or do you want it 24 seven? I mean, there's so many questions even out of that fairly simple requirement. Backlog's a similar one, you know, yeah. tell me what our backlog is. Well, do you want to know our backlog that's not current day? Do you want to know it for what's our oldest ticket, right? What are you, what are you trying to get from that information? Yeah. Um, and it's, it is a high backlog, a good or a bad thing, right? right you know, right. you may have you may be a very busy team, but you're processing things through within two days. So you could have a backlog of a thousand, but as long as they're only ever two days old, does that matter? Right. And so again, what's the story you're trying to tell and who are you trying to tell it to? And what's the result they're trying to get to? Because, yeah. because all of those things influence the way the question's been asked and the way that you answer it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And then again, it's understanding what's being asked and a couple of sort of um, basic building points, uh, building blocks for us are understanding measurements and metrics. Uh, measurements are single data points. Uh, an example is we got 437 incidents that were created in a month. Calendar month, 30 days, uh, it says month, so that's fine. And then metrics are data points with context. So an example would be that of those incidents, 23% of them have a status of pending and it was in a pending status for five days or longer. So we've seen that we've taken sort of a measurement in terms of the incidents and then we could actually put a, a context on that data that gives us a metric that we can use the percentage of incidents that are pending and for how long that they're pending. Uh, again, to, to Gordon's point and, previously. And it still doesn't tell you whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, right? That, you're, well, you're on the journey to understanding yeah. that, but maybe that's OK, yes. right? Depending why they're pending could could vary that that um, data point um, further. Yeah, absolutely. And then that's inferring the story from the data. So we've got those data points. You know, we had the 433, 4, 437 um, incidents. and an example is, you know, service manager captures lots of data and, um, you know, every data point in in that space um, is available. And uh, into, in, in Gordon's environment, there are other data points that are out, outside of service manager that are brought into into sort of the reporting data set. Yeah, and we I have learned all sorts of time entry data, cost data, um, everything that, that helps me tell that story better. Right. And then we have the again inferring the story from the data. We have the metrics that we've looked at before. Twenty-three percent of incidences, for example. And then we had a, another point in the story that says half of those incidents came from operations manager, and the rest came from email or portal. And to, again, to Gordon's point, is it good or is it bad? Really, these um, the context to data allows us to build a story, and then we have to sort of you know infer from the story whether or add insight to the story as to whether it's good or bad. And so the point is here, you know, what is the story we're trying to tell about these 437 incidents? And it could be a, a different story. The data could give us a different story according to who the audience is. Um, you know, if if uh, if someone's looking after operations manager, um, uh, you know, uh, false reporting, for example, you got a lot of false positives. You know that may be a big thing for the op, the ops manager to kind of make sure that it's it's making it's bringing up the 
errors the incidences in a correct fashion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a classic example there. So our objectives, uh, you know, through this this presentation is really to look at how we can make better informed decisions. Um, we have probably more questions and answers, but that's our objective nonetheless. And uh, how we garner wisdom from data. And then we'll be looking at sort of the DIKW model, the DIQA model um, out of ITIL. And also our objective is to evolve better practices and responses to the environments that we're in, um, because really that's the goal of data visualization or data reporting in general, is to allow us to respond, react, um, uh, evolve better practices to, to what we're facing in our businesses. So we'll start with the, 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 the DICWA model. And, uh, yeah, so 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 um, data information, knowledge and wisdom, it's it's a journey, right? Mm -hmm. And so we've talked a lot about uh, data thus far. We've talked a lot about how we get from individual data points. Uh, you know, um, Steve mentioned service manager has probably literally thousands of them uh, mm -hmm. between multiple tables, multiple records, you know, whether it's user data, you know, their department, their region, their location, etc. Um, to ticket data, like, you know, ticket numbers and, and time open, time close, priority, yeah. etc. Just thousands and thousands of data points mm -hmm. that in and of themselves don't don't really tell you anything. Um, they're individual facts, as Steve mentioned earlier, the data yeah. itself is just data. Um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't change unless you change it, right? Um, and so when you start to apply context to that data, then you start to get into information. Yeah. And so you start to organize the data, you start to pull together <clears throat> some of those data points that we were kind of talking about those 437 incidents, okay? So what is some of that context? Well, some of the context is 23% were pending more than five days or 50% or of the 23% were from operations manager. And so you're starting to dive into the data and shape the story uh, mm -hmm. that you're trying to tell. But again, you know, I, I'm often heard to say to people, they share they share data with me and sometimes they share information with me. And I'm, I look at it and I go, that's interesting data. It doesn't really tell me anything, right? right? And so whether that's a trend, whether that's a slice on the data, um, anything that you can apply that context to is going to help you get to the meaning of the data. Mm -hmm. And so the meaning of the data starts to then lead you into that knowledge component. And as you can see, the triangle is getting smaller as we get to the top here. Uh, and the idea is it's, it's a harder and harder to get to the top. It takes effort, right? It takes uh, time and learning and iteration. Um, but you start to then get to understand the concepts and, and, and taking that information and, and further applying more context, more meaning, um, ultimately getting to insight which takes you to the top of the pyramid and takes you to that wisdom. And the wisdom is really what drives the ability to change, right? It mm -hmm. allows you to support change or drive change. Uh, it, it can be both. Wisdom's not always going to drive change necessarily. It may give you insight to change. It may give you insight to a budget decision um, or it may give you insight to a problem or something you need to tackle. But ultimately, the more time you can spend on wisdom, the better your organization is going to be um, because you're not spending time crunching data and information. And mm -hmm. some of that, some of that speaks to tools, right? Some of yeah. that speaks to what are the right tools for the job. Some of that speaks to knowing the right requirements and making sure that you can spend that time on on the wisdom section if you can. Yeah. <clears throat> Steve, did you have a, a thought? I, I, I was going to say, um, I. I Jumping through to that, you know, the next slide there that talks about the Deming, the Deming cycle, um, and really, you said it already that it, it is an iterative process. Um, the the pyramid isn't necessarily a matter of putting in a ton of data to get a little bit less information, a little bit less knowledge, and a little bit less wisdom. It really is. It's harder to you know. There's hard. It's it's a. It's not a, a matter of size of data as much as it's mainly you're going to get your gleaning. It's harder to get information out of the, yeah. the cycle and as you go up. You're, you're refining, right? So you're yes. getting, you're, 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 you're refining as you go. You're climbing the pyramid, right? And yeah. so it's hard to get to the top, but the rewards, if you can get up there, the views are fantastic, right? And so yeah. if you can get to the top of the pyramid and, and spend time looking around and applying that wisdom to what you see, 
that's yeah. really truly where you where you win uh, yeah. with this. Um, but it's but it's not you get to the top and you're there and then you can sit right. back and drink coffee and eat bonbons, right? <laughs> yes, uh, what so to do. The damning the damning cycle is a great way to kind of look at um, the that pyramid um, in a different perspective. And so mm -hmm. ideally, if you if you are a well-defined business, right? How many other? How many of us are in one of those, right? If you understand your vision, your strategy, your business need, your tactical goals, your operational goals, then you've got the wisdom that then allows you to say, okay, it it should be easy from there to define what you're going to measure because yeah. you're measuring in support of those objectives, right? And so you're you're in your top right quadrant there. You're thinking about your data, you're gathering it, who and how and when. Right, you're figuring out um, how you evaluate the integrity of that data. So Steve said earlier that you know it's no 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 good being upset about what the data tells you because the data is just the data. Yeah. Uh, but maybe you're upset because the data is telling you something that you don't believe, right? And so now you have to go back and think about: Am I capturing the right data? Right. Am I capturing yeah. data with accuracy, right? And what operational goals am I supporting? What measurements am I trying to get from my service? And so you then move into kind of your information section there. So that same DICWA pyramid represented here in, in these quadrants, you're processing the data. How often do I need to do it, right? If you, if you want real-time data, that's a different perspective than a monthly trend or, a, or an annual budget supporting report, right? There's, there's right. a whole bunch of different things into that. You know, what format do I need to see? What tools and systems do I have available? Or should I go purchase? Or how do they support what I'm trying to accomplish? Um, and again, back to that accuracy question. And so, you know, then you're into your knowledge. Am I analyzing it? What are my trends? What are my targets? What improvements am I looking to get to? Yeah. Um, and that's that information. Is that data? Is that pyramids getting narrower? Is am I spending more time in the analysis phases? Um, what am I trying to present? How am I trying to use that information? What's my summary? What's my planning, right? What am I yeah. getting out of it? Because if I'm not, to, to Steve's point, if I'm not doing anything with it, then yeah. it's just going to be a report that sits in an electronic drawer or even a paper drawer in some cases that's never going to get used. And that's that's a, a waste of effort. Uh, and then can I can I use that insight? Can I use that improvement plan to to implement some some change that, yeah. that ultimately either supports or drives change in my business strategy, my vision, etc. And yeah. so this is a this is a this is a loop. This never stops. Um, the more you do this, the better you will be, yeah, the better your absolutely. data will be, the better your output will be, the stronger your vision and strategy and goals will be, because you'll always be able to refine and support. Um, and so you know planning, doing, checking, acting, planning, doing, checking, acting, right? It's it's a continuous loop. Yeah, yeah. And and I I I I can be I've had the criticism of being a sort of a, a perfectionist. I can I can procrastinate on getting something done because I want it to be done just right. And this iterative process is one of those things that you really have to lean into getting around the circle first before you kind of focus on trying to get everything, every every quadrant just perfect. You want to get around, you want to go around this loop because getting around the loop is going to actually inform you in each of the quadrants better. You know, if you go from understanding um, a strategy that you want to improve with a business need, for example, you find out the key elements of data, not every data point, but the ones that will allow you to evaluate or, or build a criteria. And then you look at how often you want to get that report out to people because if they can act on it weekly, get it to them weekly, don't get it to them daily, you know. Um, and then you just kind of work yourself around this loop. The more you go around, the the better, the more comfortable you feel with each of the quadrants, I think. And yeah, the, the, uh, you the quality, the quality builds in the sure. fact that you've gone around the loop lots of times rather than trying to think I've got to make wisdom. I've got to get every point of wisdom perfect before I get every point of data and that sort yeah. of thing. And you mentioned earlier, Steve, you know, I think I think many of us fall into that trap, right? Perfection is the enemy of mm. progress, right? And yes. so you, you, you have to make progress. Uh, you know, there's a lot of thinking these days around uh, tools like Kanban, right? Or, or mm -hmm. Azure DevOps, right? Where there's a very iterative approach, Scrum yeah. Masters, all that, all that good stuff. Uh, it's a very different approach than a lot of us are used to, particularly mm -hmm. those of us who've been in the business a long time. Right. And so, and, and getting, switching your mindset to that iterative approach uh, really can bring 
both short term and long term results. Yeah. Uh, and making sure that making sure obviously the short term results aren't just you know padding, making sure you're actually trying to drive towards something. But yeah. but at the same time, don't spend all of your time in the data and none of it getting to the wisdom. Yes, absolutely. Very cool. So where do we need to start? Um, got some key points. We touched on this in the in the model and also in the in the Deming cycle. Determining data representation uh, is definitely key. We looked at um, in the information step whether things are real time versus trend in or analytics. Um, those are kind of just easy touch points in terms of determining what kind of data we want to represent. Also, determining data sources. Uh, that really speaks a lot to the kind of data or the dimensions of the data that we're looking at. Um, if you have something that is, if you have a monthly report, having it having it so granular that it's down to the day or the hour may just be um, too much data, for example, or just it's not a useful data point. Having the dimensions appropriate to the question that you're trying to answer or the story that you're trying to present is, is very important. Um, and, and data shaping is a key element here. So one of the one of the um, iterative steps as you go through this and as you get to your wisdom and you get back to your data, um, you may find that the shape of your data doesn't match what you're trying mm -hmm. to what you're trying to get out of the story. And so um, you may have to spend some cycles cleaning and improving and shaping your data through the use of templating, through the use of training of your agents, if it's a service desk, for example, yeah. you know, making sure that the data t is able to provide the 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 start of the story. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing worse. I've, I've done it before. Um, I, I'll confess I've done it at Cyrus and, and at previous companies where I've been asked a question and I didn't have the dimension available to answer the question with it. <laughs> you know, if you don't have that, if you don't have that data point as a dimension, for example, in the cube, um, it's not going to show up on a, it's not going to show up on a report. Um, so it's important to understand the elements that you want uh, to have in there. Uh, that ties in with context as well. Um, I think that's a, a similar a similar story in terms of understanding um, the kind of data that you want to have represented as a data source, and also type. Um, that that comes down to sort of the mechanics of whether you're looking at integers, uh, integers or text or or image blob, and there's obviously there's kinds of data that you can you will, you want to consider in terms of uh, mapping your sources to. And then visuals, uh, essentially whatever you've got represented and pulled in as a data source has to be presented, represented in some way that makes sense to the audience. Um, and you know that's oft often takes the form of graphics. Uh, we'll see that in some of the examples, our examples um, further along. And also tables and counts, uh, the opportunity to drill through, starting from a big picture perspective on data, and then being able to drill through to the, the subsequent um, subunits or subcomponents is often helpful. Uh, as well as data linking, you may have um, data that kind of spurs a question into a different data set. And you know, I've been able to quickly link from something that you're drilling through, for example, and then bouncing off to another data set keeps your keeps the story coherent and cohesive because you're 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 bringing the information the relevant information to the audience at the time they're willing to consume it. Um, so that's definitely key. Yeah. So we that example sort of leads into sort of the tools available. Um, System Center, uh, that's that's where most of our, our lives revolve around is a is a SQL a SQL backend service. So SQL reporting services is probably one of those those key tools that has been around um, since SQL. So, yeah, and it's 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 one of my least favorite. I have to be honest. Um, I, I feel like yes, we we've, we've got all this data. It's all in SQL, right? Um, and, and certainly, you know, previous folks I've worked with have have tried their darndest to to teach me SQL, and and I can I can get by if I really have to. Um, but but to me, it feels particularly for some of the folks who are, are perhaps more on the manager side, more on the staff management side, less on necessarily the technical side. Mm -hmm. SQL reporting services seems like a, a fairly high barrier to entry 
um, compared to some of the other tools that are available that will give you just as good or rich data um, yeah. in the end. So, yeah. Yeah, just my, and, just my personal opinion. I, I, and I, I think that's I think that's that's probably going to co be consistent across the audience. There, there are even if you're you know you you have an ability to to join join tables and views and run queries in SQL. There are definitely other ways to other tools that are probably more um, conducive to presenting good visualization, good dashboarding. And one of those is is the size and portal dashboard itself. Um, I, as a as a person who dog foods our own portal and um, use it every day, uh, having the dashboard functionality that's built into the Cyrus and portal helps me because when I've got real time data that I need to represent um, in that portal space, the the, the portal dashboard makes the most sense for me. And whether it's coming from um, CSV, SQL, O data sources. The, it's an opportunity for me to to use that tool to represent data, and I'll show a couple of examples um, as we go along here. Yeah, and it's a fairly um, easy way to Steve, I think, to um, to share the data to specific audiences, right? And so mm -hmm. th there's some good flexible opportunities in the tool to to show views to to present data based on group membership, right? And so yes. you can create you could even create the same report 15 times, but each each person coming in only sees one version of it because mm -hmm. of their their access rights, and so it's a nice way to kind of um, to show people the data they care about versus all of the data. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's again, it's it's extensible. There's there's a, a lot of innovation going on in that space uh, to right. kind of keep the the data yeah, real. Every release it seems like has got some cool new features for that. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then this we have, is my favorite. Yeah, yeah this is this go. is my baby. Power Query in Excel. Um, you know, I, I I mentioned earlier I've been in the business a long time. Uh, obviously, Excel has been around most of that time, uh, and so the ability to quickly um, pull data out of um, SQL tables without necessarily having to know how to join tables or write SQL scripts. Uh, for me, this is the most versatile. Um, mm -hmm. it, it allows the the quickest way to join data together, and it and it. Excel in and of itself, because I'm very comfortable with it, um, it, it is a very easy tool to pivot from to create charts and, and so on and so forth. This is definitely my go to. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's it's yeah, you we can't you can't knock it for sure. It's definitely um, the, the sort of the gold standard. Um, and then I don't I wouldn't say hot on its heels, but certainly it's uh, an, an, an innovative cycle. Um, within the uh, the reporting offering from Microsoft is Power BI and uh, um, I I enjoy it. I, I, I like it. It's very it's very graphically rich, um, which is which is one of its pluses. Um, it can be very simple in terms of just literally dragging and dropping things um, into into grids or panels. Um, and it can also be very complex in terms of whether you're looking at sort of comparative data um, and drilling through um, you know a lot of a lot of reporting elements that you can bring to the um, to the page and it's probably one of those that is most conducive to self-service because um, I think it's got lots of tool point lots of tool sets that allow the audience to kind of do infer the data themselves they can uh, turn on and off sections or or settings they can slide. They've got sliders and things they can pull and portion and all that sort of good stuff like going to the and, science and museum. Easy, yeah, and easy to present in multiple platforms too, right? Yes. It's got its own publication platform, but you can publish it into Teams. You can publish it on SharePoint. Much easier to kind of make it more readily available to that self-service audience that you were that you were yeah. kind of talking about. Yeah, and we stick we stick in it. I I stick this in an iframe into the portal too, so right. that's kind of a, a a cheat way to get that sort of power by power bi richness in the same sort of window window frame of the portal sure so let's look at some examples so yeah so this is this is uh some of my examples here um we have uh spent many years i i, I show you this not to specifically get into any of the individual charts or data points um really more to speak to kind of some of the different visualizations that we talked about right so you've got you know some fairly simple bar slash line uh, integrations um, mm -hmm. and you've got some stack bars versus lines uh, or you've got some uh, you know right there in the center my boss's favorite chart 
Um, so, so this chart speaks very much to um, multiple dimensions and multiple components of a, of a story that she can infer from one individual chart. So mm -hmm. it speaks to, you know, incoming um, incoming data. So what kind of ticket types do we have coming in? It speaks to uh, the user headcount and, and how that's varying over time. You can see that's actually pretty flat. Uh, it speaks to um, device counts um, and it speaks to the, the red area in the background, speaks to how the backlog is looking in comparison to all of those other data points. Mm -hmm. And so you've got multiple um, dimensions going on here. You've got two axes, you've got a time, uh, time obviously uh, along the bottom, but it allows you to kind of see if, if we're doing the right things, if we are solving problems at the root cause, if we are um, doing a better job of change management, then we should see incoming ticket volume going down. Uh, mm -hmm. At the same time, potentially headcount is going up and device count could be going up, but the backlog is also coming down. So over time, you expect as you continue your improvement journey to see those dimensions change uh, in, in relation to that. And then, of course, you've got some fairly simple, you know, uh, thermometer type views, uh, which are what those are one of the things I haven't yet figured out how to do in Power BI, for example. <laughs> um, and you've got a fairly simple data table in the bottom. So again, I, I tell you all of this not to not to focus on content, more on just to kind of give you a visual of some of the some of the things that you can quite easily do with Power Power Query and pivot tables and Excel charting. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's it's excellent. It's it's very it, it's very rich. This is not my data, so when I when I first saw it, it's like whoa, there's a lot on here. Um, but but as as Gordon kind of explains where where you go to for the story that you want to um, uh, see or represent, it's a lot. Of, it's very rich in terms of this is one sheet or one page with you know maybe a dozen a dozen points on there, and it can feel overwhelming, but actually it, it does paint a picture of what's going on in the business. Um, and it does that does that pretty well. Yeah, and, and the idea here, Steve, is to prevent um, you know the old-fashioned balance scorecard. Right, it's yeah, kind of yeah. prevent multiple dimensions um, of, and the one thing that's missing on here actually is, is CSAT, which I have on a different page. But um, it, the idea is to try and prevent a balanced view of the environment, mm -hmm. right, from yeah. utilization of the portal versus savings versus ticket counts, right? There's a, there's a whole bunch of different dimensions yeah. that, in totality, give you a view of um, of the of the operation. Yeah, yeah, that's a health. It gives you that's that's your health report in in a fashion. Yep. And then so um, I, I show you this one in con in con in contrast um, because some of these charts are Power BI versions of some of the ones you saw on on the previous page. And so if we use my boss's favorite chart, in this case it's on the bottom right here, um, you can see I have all the same data points. Um, but the visualization, that red line, instead of being a red area behind the mm -hmm. chart is a red line and it, and it almost gets a little bit lost in the chart. Yeah. Um, the story is no different. The data points are no different. The objective is no different. Um, but in this particular case, this is one of the areas where I feel Power BI doesn't have the ability to represent in the same visual punch that, mm -hmm. that um, Excel charting does. On the other hand, the Excel charting view that, that you just saw, that term, that's a, a, a fairly manual process to keep it up to date. There's a lot of power query refreshing and things going on in the background, some of which you have to do manually, whereas this in power, is in Power BI. And to Steve's point earlier, this is almost 100% self-service, right? Mm -hmm. I can publish this, my boss can refresh it, they can see the latest data sets, uh, and they can use this uh, on a day by day basis, hour by hour, if you really want yeah. to, to to kind of see that data point. And so different um, different horses for different courses, right? Yeah. Depending on yeah. what you're, what you're trying to do and, and who you're trying to do it for. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a this is an example of um, one of my portal dashboards. Uh, actually, I've I've got it in a couple of over a couple of slides. Um, this top half just shows. Uh, very simple example of, of counter data that's being brought in and um, count data allows me to kind of have a, a sense of a, a metric that I'm uh, that we need to meet and I can color code the the, the 
the counts so that if they hit a threshold, they turn a different color. Right now, these are all, these are all blue, which is good. If they go high or too low, then they, they go red. And that's an, an, an immediate risk, um, action point for me to, to look at. Uh, this is real time. It's real time in the dashboard. So for me, it's helpful. Um, if the numbers don't change every, if the numbers don't change every hour, then me sitting in front of a dashboard looking at it changing is there's no value. But it's an opportunity for me to kind of just make sure I check in during the day to see where we're at. Uh, below the count numbers, there's a, some, a couple of examples of um, uh, some basic graphical representation of uh, analysis, the analyst activity against the type of tickets that are in front of or whether they're escalated pending customer and, and those different statuses. So standard um, stacked chart, uh, stacked bar chart. Uh, again, it's in the portal. Uh, it's an easy way for me to get that information. And it's very extensible in terms of the widgets and the points I can put onto a dashboard. And then further down on that same page, I have a, uh, an example of a, a chart that used to be, actually I think there was a, a community post around this example um, of a kendo, a kendo modified chart in the sense that this, the chart used to be on three separate axes um, because they were one representing IRs, incident requests, one representing support, um, uh, service requests, and then I'd have a separate one that would give me a count of how, you know, how many tickets were opened or closed during the day. And being able to bring that through the, the tools, again, that's kind of disruptive innovation, if you like, um, bringing in some of the Kendo tools that allowed us to kind of bring that density to one set of axes was really useful for me. Um, it gives me a much better snapshot of, of where the ticket the, the ticket shape is looking across the week. This is the 30 day window, so you can see obviously the quiet times or weekends. Um, but just in terms of activity, in terms of being able to open tickets that are open, tickets that are closed and the status is within IRs and SRs. So it's very useful in that respect. And Gordon likes it. So yeah, I love this chart. I'm going to have to learn how to do one of these. This is and, and this is, you know, we talked earlier about innovation, right? Um, this is this is for me, this would be disruptive innovation. I've never done this before. So mm -hmm. learning how to do these Kendo charts for me would be, you know, disruptive innovation. I, I, yeah. I'm going to learn a new skill. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then the, the, the chart below is is again another way of data of data representation. It's a it's just uh, work items, work items created by by month and gives us a, a, an indication uh, across a, a timeline. I think it's like uh, three years just to kind of see what's going on. Um, so that, again, that's a way that we can just bring those sorts of data points into into the portal dashboard very um, easily and eloquently. Um, this is my Power BI example. Um, and it's I built this. Than mine, <laughs> <laughs> I, it took a while to build, and actually, it's um, some of the tech behind it is that um, it, it's not fed by direct um, by direct queries. It had to be populated um, from table from tabular data, brought into Power BI, and then it uses the um, the. Uh, um, the data language, I forgot the, the name escapes me right now, um, like a DAX, the DAX query mm -hmm. yeah. um, language that it uses in, in the portal. So I got more richness in there, a lot of work, a lot of queries, a lot of things going on. Um, and actually, I'm probably the biggest consumer of my own report because I use it to tell a story to the rest of the business. So uh, a question might be, what's the spread of our tickets across our three regions? I can look, I can come here and look at it very quickly. That donut chart in the middle gives me a very even spread as to where the ticket, um, the, the, the ticket spread across the regions, yellow being APAC, um, uh, the, the, uh, green, the green is North America and the gray, the gray area is Europe. So that's a very easy way for me to kind of work on that data. I can use the ticket statuses to determine, to, to look at tickets that are historically things that have been closed. So I can look at it for tickets that are active versus tickets that are closed um, based on their statuses. Um, the bottom right hand corner gives me um, a, a insight into product category. Um, uh, the majority of our tickets come out of the portal space. Um, no real surprise. And there's that granularity within 
how those um, how those categories are, are shaped. Um, and then, you know, there's information around the analyst group and in terms of how the analysts workload is spread across those regions. So I use this very much to kind of do the, the, the poking and tweaking and, and twisting and turning and then um, answer those questions from the business using uh, a Power BI example like this. Something a little bit more simpler would then allow, you know, to, to um, uh, Gordon's point is something a little bit simpler where it's more self-service where you may have a, a question that you ask for the month and you want to roll it over a quarter. You know, you can have a slider that gives you that information, for example, or you want to look at statuses ver open versus closed or escalated tickets versus open tickets and so on. You can use that with the status information there. But uh, I, I like it. Um, it is very, it's nice eye candy. Um, but again, you've got to make sure it, it brings value. It has to change behavior and I can tell you, this model helps me drive the behavior of the team, so um, I definitely get value from it. Uh, another example that we have as well is uh, in our portal. Um, if you log in as a, a as a as a user, we have a, a support homepage, um, sort of a landing page that you can get a very kind of um, overview look within within um, a dashboard type of style. And this is an example of me logging in and uh, you know, I'm greeted with uh, the top bar that tells me some information and I've got my request and my team requests within my organization or, or that I've raised myself, for example. And then information like what's new or frequently asked questions or KB articles can be added and and populated on this page in a, in a kind of a home page format. Um, it's it's another way of representing data that is quick and easy for people to consume. Um, and that's really the, 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 the point of something like this in an, in an organization. And then my last example here is, is bringing, bringing um, sort of disparate or, or other data points into the context of a ticket. And I find this really useful um, because it allows, it allows me to uh, the top right hand corner is in the header. It gives me information around the customer and the affected user on a ticket. So while I'm, you know, while a ticket's coming and, and being worked, these touch points tie back to our CRM tool and allows me to either look at the look at what's going on with the company uh, within our CRM um, uh, product. Also, what's going on with the affected user within our CRM product. Uh, maybe we've reached out to them on, on another occasion. Maybe there's some um, there's some project work going on. Um, it again gives us a richer picture of what's going on around um, a particular ticket. And the nice thing is it's in the header. So as you scroll down through your ticket, you know, the header is in front of you, front and center. Uh, we also surface some information around their support status, account type, their, their end date. Um, and again, that can be flagged whether they're you know whether it's expired or not. That sort of information gives us another richness within the portal um, tied to a ticket. It's context, it's context-driven data um, that we can use and are very helpful. No, I love it. I love the um, little color coding on the on the end date and stuff as well. Yeah. Um, to kind of very visually just draw your attention to that straight away. Yeah. Yeah, and we use we use the we use the CRM and you know configuration item data to bring into that header, but it's it's not it's not limited to it's not limited to that as a data source. You could have uh, it, it could tie to it could tie to their um, their hardware information, for example, or or assets that that the the end the affected user is in front of or has control over. Um, you know, that's an example of sort of bringing the, um, you know, bringing some innovation in terms of what you could bring into a header that makes the ticket easier to close or gives the analysts that extra bit of information so that they completely satisfy the customer requirement. Um, yeah, and a great so, example I could think of for that, Steve, might be if you're if you're a network support organization, right? You're mm -hmm. doing a lot of networking support, um, and you're you know getting calls from your users or or, or from your um, operations manager telling you when their network connection goes out. You might want to throw 
um, you know, glean some information from the user in terms of location and then throw up a weather uh, link up there, right. right? It says, hey, we're having a storm on the East Coast. This this could be, doesn't necessarily mean it is, yeah. but from a context and information perspective, maybe that is having a factor on the the fact that you're, you've got a network ticket open here, right? Yeah. And, and just gives you that bit better information at your fingertips without having to go searching for it. Yeah. And if if wisdom if wisdom shows the relationship between weather and outage, then it's worth having it on the page. Right. You Absolutely. Know? So yeah. So those sorts of those sorts of insights that you can glean and then bring them together in a in a on the platform makes it stops the second guessing of the analyst, and that's that's again a, a drives behavior in the right direction. Yeah. Um, what's next? Um, you know, we come to the end here. What you know you. We want we want uh, to empower people to tell their story, you know, tell your story through data. And it's kind of three three questions I guess we want to leave you with. Um, you know, what are you innovating? Um, you can innovate in those dimensions that we that we discussed, whether it's incremental, uh, disruptive, architectural, or radical. Those are areas that you know you can apply innovation. It doesn't have to be burn everything and start again, but certainly to think about innovating. Um, understanding, you know, do you understand what's being asked? And ask again and again. I think um, sometimes we do get caught into that perfection mindset that we think we know the answer. Um, it's useful to really go through that again and again. And then how do you gain actionable, how do you gain actionable knowledge from the data? Um, if you can drive an action or behavior through the collection of accurate, and timely data, then you are better positioned to respond and and um, not necessarily react, but but evolve, if you like, within your business environment. If you know something's coming down the pike, you know that your database is filling up because you've got a particular backlog of things going on. That information should drive an action and and. Um, a driver behavior, if you like, whether it's something that you do all the time as a standard operating procedure because your data tells you to do this every week, or whether it's a particular action you take or an initiative that you take um, to drive the business forward. Uh, so those yeah. are. As you say, Steve, I think the key though is your first point there is tell your story. Right, mm -hmm. the emphasis should be on your story because mm -hmm. you can get standard reports, canned reports. You can take a look at some of the reports that Steve and I use uh, on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. You say, "I want to have that report," but it may not tell your story. That's right. True. Back to that that um, understanding of requirements. What am I being asked for, and what are the requirements, and what am I? What story am I trying to tell? That's more important than any of this, right? Yeah. Because if you don't know where you're trying to get to, you'll never get there. Yeah. And so making sure that you, and, and, and some of that's going to be iterative, like we talked about, you're going to be around that Deming cycle three, four, five, a hundred times, right? Mm -hmm. um, hopefully not a hundred, but, but you know, the idea is you, you continue to go around until you get to the core of the story you're trying to tell and, and the data and then the information, knowledge, et cetera, that is, that is going to help you support that story. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's awesome. And uh, that's my last slide. And all I've all left to say is uh, thank you for your attention and your time uh, throughout our presentation. I hope you found some things useful. Um, you'll find both Gordon and I in the uh, the Q and A lounge uh, directly following this presentation. And again, if you miss us in that lounge, uh, feel free to drop into the open floor uh, lounge session. That will be open all the way throughout the day for the. Uh, for the event presentations. Um, so again, thank you, Gordon. Yeah, for your, thank you. Your, your help and insight, and I appreciate everyone attending today. So thank you very much. Take care, guys.